Good morning. I'm Nadja Fuad. I'm a, a professor of psychology at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And as I say, I am not an engineer, nor do I play one on TV. But um, I have done a, a fair amount of work on looking at why women stay and leave engineering. And I'm pleased to be here to moderate this panel. And just to give you a sense of what we're going to do, um, we have a presentation by Dr. Silvia Hurtado, who's Professor of Education and Director of the Higher Education Research Institute at the University of California, Los Angeles. And she's joined by her colleague, Kevin Egan, who also is a Professor of Education and a researcher at the Higher Education Research Institute at the University of California, Los Angeles. They're going to present for 30 minutes. And there will be, um, we are asking you to please hold your questions till the end, unless there's a specific clarifying question that you uh, need before they can go on with their presentation. But we will have about 10 minutes at the end of their presentation for any questions that come. And then we will be joined by three panelists who, and I will introduce them when, they, when we're ready for their presentation. So at this point, I invite you guys to begin. Thank you. Good morning. Oh. Good morning. <laughs> Um, I'm pleased to introduce you to a set of studies that we have been doing actually for the past 11, almost 12 years. Um, uh, my colleague and I, Kevin Egan, have been working on a number of studies uh, that started in 2004. So this is a very unique kind of data set we're looking at. It's a cohort we began. Uh, if you, uh, you know what we do at the Higher Education Research Institute, we've been studying college students for 50 years as they enter college. And one of the things that's important is that we try try to get their aspirations and their preparation, information about them before they enter, as they just step onto campus. And our main focus has always been college effects. What is the relationship between college effects and some outcomes? Uh, with this particular uh, group of analyses that we did as part of what will become the commission paper, and we're, we're welcoming feedback as we have lots of data on college students. Um, we actually follow the cohort beginning in their freshman year of college through completion, some of whom did not complete. So we'll show a little bit about that story. And then on into the post baccalaureate career. Now the last time we did a survey was seven years after college entry. So this is a pretty young group. The other thing that's important to know about this particular group, they actually were finishing about the time that the recession hit. So what does it look like? So we asked some additional questions related to that. I'm not sure if we have them all in this presentation. We have almost 50 slides, so we're going to try to go through quickly. Um, I'm going to ask Kevin to tag team whenever he wants to input. Uh, Kevin was responsible for administering the post-baccalaureate survey. He coordinated, so he knows all the details of, uh, and probably much of what you don't want to know uh, about how you put that together and, and reach uh, more than 13,500 students who responded to our post-baccalaureate survey. So let me go ahead and begin. Uh, we're going to look at, uh, we were asked to look at some key outcomes. We looked at the committee's objectives and we determined these were possible. We can switch them around or actually focus on more on one or the other, and we have as a result of conversations. We're going to talk about uh, earning the degree and also the aspirations, what they continue to aspire to do postgraduate. Uh, we have a bit on the graduate professional school experiences. We're going to see the proportion of students that enter that. Uh, more importantly, we're looking at em em immediate employment expectations, career goals, their current salary, employment status, most recent primary career, and also the relevance of the college degree and reasons for not working in a related field. So our data sources, as I said, began with a freshman survey, and then we matched it with national data on completion. The National Student Clearinghouse now monitors term-to-term -term enrollment on college students. For all institutions that participate, and I think over 95% of institutions in the US participate now in this. So it's a fairly good uh, and large sample as a result. Our post-baccalaureate survey had about, uh, as I said, 13,500 students. It was sponsored by NIH and NSF. And now we're also looking at CSTAT, though we currently only have access to the public, and so we don't have very much information on that, but I know other researchers have presented that to this group. And we combine our data also with IPEDS data because we always want to know something about the kinds of institutions students had attended as, high, as college students. 
The post-baccalaureate survey then, uh, those who were completing uh, were about 1,956 students who completed and earned degrees in engineering. These are the breakdowns and descriptions of the demographics uh, of the survey respondents. Um, so this is the proportion of males and females. So you see, uh, now we think it tracks on very similarly to some of the other data sets. Uh, I think one of the questions that arose with our conversations with the committee was really, there are women going into different fields, and of course we do know that's the case. So this gives us an idea of on completion, where they completed, and the proportion of men, men relative to women in terms of selecting different engineering fields. Um, so we know, for example, that women are more likely to be in uh, a number of fields, including um, uh, civil engineering and uh, and industrial engineering, uh, mechanical engineering, and uh, a number of other fields. And the other engineering field, which maybe Kevin can give us some insights into what other engineering represents here. Sure, so we looked at that uh, back in 2004 when we first started the f this, with this cohort, biomedical engineering hadn't really taken off. And we know that about 60% of the other engineering reflected here uh, includes biomedical engineering. This is the completion rates of students uh, uh, by STEM field as aspiration. What we see is engineering has a fairly good retention rate. About 70% of students who began in engineering actually stay in engineering. Um, and so we see that's uh, somewhat comparable to the biomedical sciences, though we see the retention is better in engineering than it is in other fields. And one of the reasons we know because there are engineering schools, there are support structures, there's a range of things that really facilitate that, that retention. So we do see some loss on students who do complete the degrees, who do switch out and go to other fields, and that's more likely in the physical sciences relative to other science areas. So we are looking at the larger sample of about over 16,000 students who initially aspired and then completed, uh, completed their degrees. Do you want to talk about this? Sure, so this just gives an idea of uh, <laughs> who's completing in engineering uh, versus who's switching out or not completing. Uh, so, <clears throat> women are underrepresented uh, relative to men with regard to completing engineering and we're more likely to have switched out and completed in a different field. Uh, same with URM, underrepresented racial minority students relative to white and Asian American students. When we look at uh, parental education, those uh, whose mothers had at least a college degree were more likely to have stuck with engineering uh, among those engineering aspirants. Uh, versus having switched out to another field uh, or not completed at all. Uh, also, probably not so surprisingly with regard to prior academic achievement, we see uh, that students who were earning higher high school grades and who were uh, scoring higher on the composite math and verbal SAT were more likely to have stuck with uh, engineering. And then those who had taken uh, more physics in high school, at least two years of physics, were more likely to have stuck with engineering uh, versus having switched out or gone and uh, not earned a degree at all. Mm -hmm. Later we'll talk a little bit, uh, not a lot of time, of students who declare or actually decide to go engineering after their freshman year. We call them latecomers because the earlier you come, the better it is because you get all the benefits of really having both a peer group and also support. So this is the highest degree earned of this cohort of students. Remember, it's a single cohort of students and a unique one in that uh, when they went to college. Um, and so only about 15% had earned a master's degree. And then, of course, very few by that seventh year had earned a PhD or MBA, but there were a handful of students who did so. So the highest degree then they aspire to is something we really want to follow because these are how students anticipate where they will go. So about 12% in uh, PhD, about 11% MBA, they're aspiring to those degrees. Um, and so we also see differences by which kinds of college they attended. Uh, public institutions are more likely to, uh, students there are less likely to aspire beyond a bac baccalaureate degree, um, and private institutions more likely to aspire to a PhD and beyond the students who started and, and have completed uh, their degrees. Uh, also, students in private institutions are more likely to aspire in health fields. 
This is comparing the highest degree aspirations by the selectivity of the type of institution that one uh, st the students attends. Obviously, uh, the more selective institution students are aspiring to post uh, baccalaureate degrees uh, and beyond, even beyond the masters if they go to a more selective college. This is comparing the highest degree aspirations by gender, and so there are uh, gender differences, and um, I'll have a summary uh, of that coming up. In terms of uh, underrepresented groups, they're uh, less likely to have uh, aspire to uh, the highest degrees uh, beyond, uh, beyond the master's, but they're very similar in terms of other groups in terms of aspiring, aspiring to a master's degree at this stage of their early career. So women are more so uh, likely to aspire to a bachelor's degree as their highest degree than men, and men are more likely to aspire to a master's as their highest degree than women. Underrepresented groups to aspire to a master's degree than white, but less likely to aspire to a PhD. This gives you just a uh, graphic view, and um, you're welcome to use this in the report if you'd like to, uh, of students completing degrees and where they end up and what choices they make. Um, and so for this particular cohort, about 55% immediately entered the workforce. So this is interesting because we remember, recall that I said this, this group actually uh, were completing just as the recession, we were just in the middle of it and it was, they were pulling out of it and so uh, when they completed this was, this was occurring. And about 35% decided to go to graduate school and 10% are unemployed. Uh, or neither going to graduate school or in the workforce. So we see if they choose to go to graduate school, they're more likely to do so in engineering, and also if they choose to go in the workforce, more likely to do so in, in, in engineering. So this just gives you an idea. We're gonna follow these different pathways to really understand a little bit more about students. This is the, the workforce uh, pathway. So this gives you a sense of then of gender and racial differences in terms of the post-college uh, choices of pathways, and later we'll have a multivariate model predicting this. But uh, for, uh, for example, we know that uh, men are more likely to be employed full-time. Um, the salaries are uh, very similar for men and women, something that surprised us. There's some variations in the distribution, but uh, tests of the means showed no significant difference. Um, Underrepresented groups are less likely to be earning uh, higher uh, than their counterparts, white and Asian comp counterparts. And then we're gonna follow up a little bit in terms of the relevance of the degree to their current position in terms of group differences. This is the current employment status of engineering degrees. So we see a high proportion are employed full time, which was surprising for us for this young cohort coming out of the time that they did. So. I think the conclusion is yes, this is a good job choice uh, because students are finding jobs. There are a few, however, that are not employed and looking for work, about 5%. Um, and the, about 14% have decided to attend graduate school and are actually working at their, in, their institution where they're graduate students. So there's their differences in employment outcomes by race, ethnicity, and we see that, uh, again, as I sort of stated earlier with regards to the salaries, that URMs are less likely to be employed full-time and more likely to be looking for work or employed part-time. This gives you a difference of, in terms of different disciplines that the, st the students had uh, completed their degree in and how they were employed full time. We see they're, they're very comparable except for uh, computer engineering and also industrial engineering, which is a bit higher than the other groups. These are other employment outcomes of engineering uh, baccalaureate recipients uh, across the disciplines. So we just see very quickly which uh, fields uh, seem to be uh, actually sending students to graduate school. It's the, I'm looking for the gray, other engineering area. Um, this gives you a snapshot of then of their current career and occupation, and if they did not enter an engineering career, what kinds of areas they indicated that they were actually pursuing uh, or are occupied uh, doing work in. Um, so it gives you a sense of those who choose, chose other STEM careers, what kinds of work they were doing. Most were employed as computer programmers or analysts, and the non-STEM careers, uh, most were in this other category or business professional. So we gave them a choice of uh, the career occupations. We had specific uh, 
uh, ones they had to choose from. So those that chose the engineer were uh, two thirds. This gives you an idea of the early salary outcomes of, uh, of these students. So only about 16% are making greater than $75,000. Most are in that kind of middle category. And there are differences uh, by race and gender. Uh, URMs are likely to have lower salaries. Uh, and uh, females seem to be doing uh, actually about uh, the same in terms of salary when we did those tests. This actually looks at the differences of the type of undergraduate institution they attained. We actually have much more information. We can do further breakdowns on types of colleges if, if there's an interest um, in the panel. Uh, but private universities seem to do fairly well in terms of placing students in high income jobs and uh, less selective institutions, less slow in terms of salary. This gives you an idea of the different fields uh, in terms of salary uh, for these early group with uh, civil engineering being on the low side, though actually they're the group that says that they were best prepared for the kind of job that they actually are doing now. So that notion of happiness is maybe not totally tied to salary, but basically this, this alignment between what they were prepared to do and what they're actually doing is important. So proportion of engineers, this actually comes from the CSTAT data, and we only had public access. We will be getting access to the licensed data set um, to actually probe further. But this basically just gives a little bit of the, the different federal grants of contracts where the employed engineers say they were working and that were sponsored by various organizations. <coughs> <clears throat> this is the relevance of the college degree to current career among engineering uh, recipients and the extent to which they felt uh, that uh, the position is actually related to their highest degree. So URMs are slightly uh, less likely to agree that it's closely related than other groups. This gives you a sense of the relatedness of the discipline to the highest degree, and we see those in civil engineers are way up there, and the other engineering group is less so, um, but actually we have to try to unpack that a little bit further if we can. So when it comes to employment, yes? Can you just clarify the other group that has been identified again? What's yes. Sure, so it's about 60% biomedical, uh, there's another seven or eight percent who just had a basic engineering degree according to the uh, clearinghouse data. They didn't have a specific subdiscipline. Their degree just says engineering. Uh, there's a good chunk of um, material science and materials engineering in there, and then uh, some nuclear engineers. Uh, but the largest chunk is about 60 percent uh, biomedical engineer. So these, uh, the more specific uh, specificity, uh, obviously the survey cannot have every uh, engineering field, but the clearinghouse data, as I said, is term to term enrollment, and these are fields reported directly by the institutions where students are getting the degrees or choosing as majors. So when it comes to employment, the majority of engineering graduates have attained full employment, full-time employment, and at a salary range at the mid-range, fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars a year, and are staying engineering. Women, in terms of salary, seem to be doing equally well at this early career stage. Uh, at least we could not detect any significant differences. Uh, underrepresented minorities face several employment challenges, worse employment figures, lower salaries, and working in lesser related fields to the areas in which they were prepared to study, I mean, to, uh, to enter. So there are some, uh, I agree, there are some high satisfaction levels uh, among engineers uh, in terms of they're satisfied with their current standard of living. Now, we also ask questions about the economy because of this cohort. And about uh, a third said the economy had hurt their standard of living. About 38% said they had trouble finding a job. And about 48% that the economy had affected their decisions about their career at that stage. Now, economy is changing. This is a young group, so we think uh, we actually plan to follow them up. Yeah. We'll be doing a 10-year follow-up with this group, uh, hopefully starting in January, February of 2015. So job satisfaction of employed engineers, again, very high uh, for all. Their education prepared them. They see themselves working in the field for the long term, about 71% said so. I'm satisfied with the compensation package from their employer, and they feel secure in their current position, which allows them to make a lot of other decisions at this early stage, whether they want to go on uh, or seek other kinds of uh, career transitions. Uh, 
Uh, about a third felt said they did not feel challenged by their current work. Uh, they, they need to earn a graduate degree to advance the degree. About 41% think that's the case, and about 47% expect to change careers in the next five years. So for economic and job satisfaction, this is a summary slide. The majority report being satisfied with their job across several important domains. They, however, they do desire from their career, uh, about a third don't feel challenged, more still want to end, uh, uh, enter or pursue a graduate degree, and about 46% think they will change within the next five years. Though 81% of those engineering workforce are satisfied with the current standard of living and um, report, uh, but still a, a small proportion report. Some had, they had some difficulty with the economy, so we wanted to factor that into our analysis. So reasons for working in an unrelated career, these are the groups that chose other areas, so we probed that a little bit further. Um, and most of them was for uh, basically job location, the next was pay or promotion opportunities, uh, another was working conditions, um, about 48% said the job in the highest degree field was not available. Uh, less than a third said family responsibilities, and about 18%, this is still a young group, said the desire to start a family. So the question is, does it matter for us? We start with students as aspirants because our important uh, work that we want to do is it, our interest in our long-term project has been diversifying the scientific workforce. So understanding what happens in the first few years of college is very important. So does it matter if you early on indicate an engineering uh, major versus determining that later, like you transfer in or you actually are admitted to the engineering school at a later time point? Those who actually uh, indicate early on they're entering engineering are more advantaged in terms of salary, um, in terms of uh, attending graduate school, in terms of employment full time. Um, and those who came uh, late into or decided late could have been the end of the freshman year or the second year when most students determine their major um, are more likely to be employed part time. Uh, and then also we see that uh, it's about equal in terms of saying whether they were, their degree was related to their current position. Uh, and, but those who started early said it's more likely to be closely related. So we're going to just summarize quickly the graduate school, but we have a lot of information about graduate school attendance for the other 35% that are doing this at this early career stage. And the reasons for enrolling a graduate school was mostly the opportunity to learn about things that interest them. The second was the opportunity to get a better job. We have a whole battery of questions, and these are the top these were the top reasons. Less encouraging or very important was encouragement from a role model or mentor compared to those top reasons, or, and less important was inability to find a decent job. So we don't think the students were cho choosing graduate school, particularly in engineering, because, um, because, the, because of the economic uh, situation, though obviously we don't know for sure. So the, these are mostly summary slides. We do have uh, graphics that actually illustrate all of that, and some of those percentages are on there. Uh, anyway, most engineering graduates enroll in, who enroll in graduate school stay in engineering, and 9% are in business management-related programs, and about 6% are in the health profession programs. And a small proportion, 3%, actually enroll in law school. So these are the graduate disciplines of engineering uh, <coughs> BS degree holders, of those 67% where they are going to graduate school, uh, mostly civic and electrical engineering, civil and electrical engineering, and uh, some aeronautical, uh, also mechanical engineering is a big draw uh, for graduate school. Those who decided to go into other science fields, most are in the health sciences. Uh, and then physical sciences and math is the next largest, com and also computer science. The non-STEM areas, most of them are going into business-related fields, they suggest, they, uh, for graduate, uh, graduate school. So among engineering uh, BS holders, some of their experiences are what we found in some of the, we looked at the relationship between engineers in graduate school, other science students in graduate school, and those that were non-science in graduate school. And more likely, they will have worked with a professor's research project in their graduate program, even at this early stage, compared to any of the other two groups, the 
in science or in non-science fields. Um, and so very early, early on, they're connecting with faculty in their, in their graduate programs. Um, they're less likely to actually say that family re responsibilities have interfered with their graduate studies. In other words, they're rarely uh, less likely that's a problem at this stage for them, and more likely they're satisfied with the relevance of the graduate work to their career plans, about 80%. We actually have a lot of qualitative data from these students that are pretty fascinating, and those stories are incredible uh, in terms of what we were able to gather when we went to eight institutions uh, to do focus groups with students, but none of that is here. The graduate and professional enrollment experiences, um, this actually looks a little bit about what the gender and racial ethnic distribution is in, within their programs, whether they're satisfied. 40% are neutral, 47% are neutral about the representation of women, 8% um, are dissatisfied, uh, and 13% are somewhat dissatisfied or very dissatisfied with the representation of uh, women. So the top two reasons for enrolling in graduate school are to get a better job and to learn more about things that interest them. And uh, so the question also then is what predicts some of these co post-college pathways, in other words, if they have an engineering degree, deciding to go into another uh, STEM field in terms of the workforce, or deciding to um, choose a non-science field in, as their first job, or one of their earliest jobs right up, out of college. So this gives you just our significant findings uh, results. Uh, Latinos are less likely to go into engineering compared to their white counterparts, and all the other racial groups are pretty much equal with the other white, uh, their white comparators. They had higher school GPAs. Um, if they attend a four-year college, uh, if they had attend a, a higher selectivity institution, um, Oh, I'm sorry, it's the reverse. So they were more likely, or they were initial engineering aspirant, they were more likely to be in engineering versus pursuing a non-STEM pathway. And they were more likely to go into other science fields if they worked with a faculty on a research project as an undergraduate, um, uh, if they attend a four-year college, uh, and or if they had more years of, I'm sorry, if they had more years of physics, they were more likely to stay in engineering versus choose another STEM pathway. So I think a lot of engineering schools require physics for entry into, um, uh, at, at the admission stage, so this is really showing long term how this is having an impact on some of their ultimate career paths. One of the interesting points on that, uh, toward the bottom there, uh, just with the selectivity, we see, uh, we saw in one of those earlier slides at the start of the presentation that a lot of the students at engineering graduates from more selective institutions were going on to law school and business school, and that's reflected here. Once we account for everything else that we can account for, we still see this negative relationship between selectivity and a non-STEM pathway, and that's accounting for those students more likely enrolling in uh, business schools and law schools. Yeah, we have a larger model, but we only, to save time, we only show the significant effects here. But we can go back and also refine the model also with any questions. That's all right. I think it was chart 25. <coughs> yeah, this chart. Talk to this chart a bit more, because I'm looking at the, uh, the underrepresented minority line, and how should I interpret that? They're more likely to be, in, uh, their current salary they're reporting in, in the workforce is lower than other groups. So it's the green line going down. So fewer are making at the highest salaries, more are making less than $50,000 a year. Okay, so that says businesses are paying underrepresented minorities lower salaries. It actually is more likely accounting for the fact that since we're looking at all who are working both full-time and part-time, that more underrepresented students are represented in okay. the part-time workforce. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So we can, and it's true. I had a problem with this chart. Yeah. <laughs> Good. We can do some clarification because an earlier chart basically showed that uh, underrepresented groups were more likely to be employed part-time as well. So. What we did is we did take out the graduate students because we didn't want to count them in the uh, the workforce. So in these salary charts. Question here, Eric Ducharme from GE Aviation. If you go back to the chart on job satisfaction of employed engineers. Yeah. 
Yeah, right there. Uh, that last bar, the 46.4 percent, I, I expect to change careers. It, given the what you see on the the left hand side of all the satisfaction, mm -hmm. that seems like a pretty high number. Any insights into why? Uh, I think they see this first job as just their their foot in the door kind of thing, and what they're going to do is they're going to start looking. They haven't decided whether they're committed to uh, the organization they're working for, and you know, as young people, uh, people change jobs. I don't know what the we should actually look to see how frequently engineers change jobs, but it's it's pretty frequent over the course of a career, so they do expect to change over time and maybe move into management positions or perhaps uh, change sectors, and so uh, I think, do we have some information about the sectors, don't we, where they're employed? We currently just have careers, but like uh, I mentioned, we'll be going back into the field, and so we'll be able to see at least three years after they took this survey, uh, three and a half years after they took this survey, are they starting to change uh, career fields? Yeah. What's your definition of a career field? So it's, it's that list of, um, it's the list of occupations that we had. Uh, so we have the engineer, uh, then we have uh, STEM related, so physician, nurse, veterinarian. Um, so w there was a predetermined list of about 45 uh, careers that students had to choose so, from. So you could be in the same career path, but changing occupations, or you change the employers. So I think maybe teasing out what you mm. mean by that is a little bit what Eric's saying. Okay. I think Jean-Lu has something he wants to add to that. Um, it's an interesting cohort, as you said, because they started school when things were great. Uh, 2004, you said, or five? Eh? 2004. Okay. They were completing school where things were falling apart. That's right. <laughs> and, and they were, in fact, still in school when things started to fall apart. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, I talked to many kids at the time, and it was affecting. And then they entered as middle of the recession. Do you have any data, or, or at least if it, even if it's anecdotal, on a cohort before that, mm. or a cohort since then. And, and what, what would you expect would change, if anything? Mm. That's a great question. Uh, at the Higher Education Research Institute, we actually don't follow postgraduate. Uh, I think every 10 years we do a postgraduate survey, so, and that's usually a, a grant-sponded project for a particular area. So we could go back into our older databases to see um, some of the workforce questions to compare to investigate that, but currently I don't think we we have that information. So I know there's um, additional questions, but I am gonna. If it's not a clarification question, can we can we come back to it? We're done actually. Oh, you're done. Yeah, oh. <laughs> we cut about oh, know, okay. ten slides. Well, <laughs> there's <laughs> way too mm -hmm. more. Thank you. We have ten minutes for questions. It's okay. Um, can you, uh, Emily Allen, Cal State Los Angeles. Can you go back to 25 again, slide 25? So this is from my anecdotal knowledge and I wonder if you've looked into any of these things. I believe the proportion of underrepresented minorities is higher at less selective institutions, or at least possibly by geography as well. Um, and in addition, many of those populations try not to relocate when looking for jobs, all of which might affect salary. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if any of that <coughs> salary data has been disaggregated um, by institutional type or by questions about whether their first job is required relocation or not. I, th I think so. We go ahead. all of all of the graphics here. We're just taking two variables and teasing them out. I think that there's an op opportunity for us to do a more more multivariate model with regard to salary outcomes, so that we can account for where students were attending school, the type of institution they were attending, some of their demographic characteristics in their field, all at the same time to get at. Uh, you know, do we still see this uh, distribution for you underrepresented students at the lower end of the salary yeah. spectrum? I can show you really quickly what our uh, multivariate models look like because they're large and they have uh, plenty of uh, measures. These are some of the other ones that we, uh, uh, there, there it was. 
So our multivariate models, we can do this with salary, but this is predicting engineering versus attending, uh, entering a non-STEM field or engineering versus another STEM. So we can look at uh, demographics, we can look at background, and uh, we can look at uh, both high school and some college experiences, and then also understanding about the kinds of institutions they attend. Going, going back to the, uh, Alan Zimmerman, going back to the salary chart, uh, you indicated that part of it, the under, underrepresented minorities, was part-time versus full-time employment. Would that not be a, a better way to show this data is not as an annual salary, but as an hourly? Uh, mm -hmm. That way you could um, see is part-time versus full-time a contributor. And then the other question I've got related to that is geographic, you know, you've got three bins here, but geographic diversity in cost of yes. living, et cetera, a across the country. Uh, and again, it goes back to the comment that was made about people staying near certain schools. If you stay in a, um, in a part of the country that has a much lower cost of living, yes. then they actually may be in the higher bin relative to their peers but lower compared to someone who's living in a more uh, higher cost of living area. Mm -hmm. We can try to do some breakouts by uh, geographic area, but it, I think it suggests, you suggest two measures we can have in the multivariate analysis to really tease that out, that difference. Now the issue of hourly, that's probably a good question for our follow-up survey that's right. coming up. Um, is that we can't, we didn't ask the question about hourly in the survey, so that's not possible, but we can look at uh, break down the part-time, full-time, and also other things that would really uh, determine what would be part of that lower salary uh, rationale or a reason why they're earning less. There's a, oh, yes, so, uh, and, and a reminder, can you identify yourself and where you're from? Thank you, for the, particularly for the web uh, audience. So Alan Cheville, Bucknell University. I was very interested in your data on latecomers to engineering. One, the numbers are very small as we'd expect, um, but two, the, the outcomes seem to be much less so. And this seems to be, I think, driven perhaps by other factors and not by the fact they're entering engineering late. Have you explored what any of those other factors might be? Uh, yes, I think my uh, take on this, uh, having done both college admissions uh, at Princeton and MIT and also uh, studying college students for many years, I would say that one of the things that's distinctive about uh, early de declaration or coming in as an engineer, we also know that students who really come out of high school and know this, they usually have a very good training and background. Students who are not sure are usually have had no prior exposure uh, to the field uh, that, uh, be, and they, once they get to college, they begin to understand it. Now, the issue with performance in the first couple of years is a big stumbling block. So really bright students who make it through and then, then declare is, is very important, I think. But most engineering schools are using admissions um, and so, therefore, they are selecting the students who will continue on and probably have better outcomes in, in the long run. Um, the other factor could be, as I stated at one point, is that engineering schools have their own uh, student affairs officers, their own uh, associate deans that deal with undergraduate education, that, that uh, monitor advising. And if a student isn't in that bin, they're not in that group yet because they're taking general courses, they've kind of missed out on some of the support structures and maybe information they would have gotten early on because they're able to get that advising, be involved with other peers, and it, it, because it's part of a departmental culture um, or school culture uh, in engineering, that's very important. So I think part of the latecomers are, is that uh, they're an important group because we want to uh, increase uh, as many students as possible going into the fields that are necessary. Um, but I think uh, the latecomers do miss out on some of the good support structures they would have gotten and I know you were not here yesterday afternoon, but the, the deans, uh, the, the re uh, representatives of Maryland, Georgia Tech, and GW were talking about the wealth of opportunities they were uh, giving to their students across that spectrum. Great. In the, uh, yeah, yes, I believe on your, one of your slides showed that chemical engineering 
<coughs> oh, yeah. sorry. Larry yeah. Bucciarelli from MIT. Uh, one of your slides showed uh, chemical engineering was one of the fields with a significant, well, larger percentage of women. Is that correct? Yes. And I have a hypothesis that I would like you to check. That uh, in high school, uh, chemistry is well taught, and it's well taught by women mostly. Mm. And I would wager that uh, correlates well with uh, the percentage in chemical engineering. That's a great point because we can actually, um, we can't do it in high school, but we can actually <coughs> see it in college. And I have been on campuses where there's a higher proportion of women chemists in some of the departments. And that makes a big difference. Uh, and in a number of ways, not just to, we know from our faculty, we do national faculty surveys, is the teaching is different, advising loads are higher, uh, they take an interest in students' personal lives, the kinds of things that uh, sometimes men don't always do. Um, so we do find that uh, that's the case. When we look at our faculty surveys, we can, we can actually do a little bit more in that area, to find out. Uh, uh, Jean-Luc Chameau, you, you have a, at the beginning you showed that the graduation rates or completion rates of the order of 70% overall, which is, I think is, uh, I was expecting. But as you know, there is a large variation. Some institutions in engineering have graduation rates in 90% and above, yes. Yes. 95% in some of them, which means some have much, much lower. Are there uh, information you could provide us that could be important to our report with regard to that? Because that 70 percent is hiding a very significant variation in completion rates. Yeah, we could easily do this distribution of, uh, of rates by institutional selectivity, uh, other kinds of things, institutional resources. Uh, we could do that because we know that's a different, that's another project we've done. We have a long-term retention project and we've been looking at institutional resource differences and also um, their selectivities are different, so in terms of uh, the kinds of students they're educating is very different. So we see those lower graduation rates among institutions that are taking first generation, low income, a lot of uh, minority students there are near, uh, close to open access, uh, or not relatively in comparison to the most selective institutions. So we know those distinctions and differences we can look at. But you're asking about differential retention no. rates. In right? engineering. In engineering. Yeah. yeah. And I think it, and it's a very important uh, question in terms of uh, the cost of education and so on. And also there are examples in the country over the past 15 years of institutions which had rates in a, let's say in a 60% range and are now at 85 and 90%. So some places have really made some significant, I could give you names which, which I won't, uh, but it, it is still meets, uh, your data confirm there are still institutions where it's likely in a 40 or 50% or less, and that as opposed to 90% plus. And I think there is something that can be done there, so it would be useful information. Okay, we can, uh, we can do that. If they're diff uh, I'm gonna add that if there are different differential rates across different groups, persistence is different across different groups. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about your... Well, so, as Sylvia mentioned, uh, I'll make two points. We've done uh, these big multivariate models for the engineering students, physical science students, biomedical students, as well as those in the health sciences and those in psychology. Uh, so we can look at the differential across race, ethnicity, across institutional type and selectivity and resources. Uh, we've also been doing work uh, sponsored by the Helmsley Charitable Trust, uh, looking at... Uh, the efficiency with which colleges and universities produce degrees in STEM, uh, STEM generally as well as in particular STEM subdisciplines, so again biological sciences, engineering, and the like. Uh, and so th what that work is doing is accounting for the flow in and flow out of students at broader access institutions that may not get credit because they have low six-year completion rates, but they have, they're serving a number, a higher number of transfer students. Uh, and so we're wrapping up that work, uh, hopefully by the end of the calendar year with uh, the Helmsley Trust. And so you'll be seeing uh, more of that come out in the next uh, few months. Great. Um, yes, Al Bunshaft, uh, Dassault Systems. Uh, question about the bar chart on satisfaction with the career, early career. Um, I believe the chart said that 70 something percent of uh, this cohort intended to stay in the field, and yet on the same chart on the far right, it said that 46% intended to change careers within five years. How, how should we interpret those two pieces of information? 
Uh, <coughs> oh, um, unless I'm interpreting it incorrectly. The, the intent to stay no, in the field right. long term versus the intent to change careers. Do you have that? Thanks, I missed the page number. There we go. Yes, thanks. So the the difference between the first and the end part is what you're saying, or yeah, the second bar, or the I second bar, yeah, seventy one percent, long term, seventy one percent, and yet almost half say I'm going to leave this field in the next five years. My hunch is it actually connects with a point that Kitty made that uh, the interpretation of the far right bar is employers or specific job rather than the broader term of career. So while the cr question said career. Uh, and we, we'll be able to test this in our 10-year follow-up with a uh, better worded question. I think that the respondents were interpreting that as specific employer, specific job, that they're not going to stick with this current job yeah. for more than five years. Yeah. Okay, thank so you. The, the issue with a survey, when you send it out, it's really up to the respondent to interpret it. You can't be with them to understand if they really uh, do it. But I think the first one, it, I think, is very important because they see themselves in the field. That's a good question in the long term. So the career change may be, and there are many other careers that also use engineering uh, skills. So I think that that's just a, I, we don't see, I don't see it as really contradictory. And if, and if I could, did you look to see if there's any correlation between gra intent to go or, or going to graduate school and starting salaries? I know my son is 23, computer engineering degree. Uh, he and his peers were definitely influenced by very high starting salaries. They went to one of these more selective schools, getting job offers ninety, hundred thousand dollars and more at, with a bachelor's. Um, is there a correlation there between those starting salaries and, and graduate school? Um, we don't. We can actually do that. We can look at that uh, relationship. We don't have it here, but we can do Thank that you. certainly. All right. One last question, Alexa. Can you introduce yourself? Uh, I'm Alex Lockwood with uh, KAUST. Um, so I think it would be interesting for this slide and the 20, slide to 25 with all of the salaries to also see with you know the other 10,000 people you have in the survey to see the, the non-engineering oh, okay. majors and do they feel well prepared? What are their salaries at this point in their career? Um, I think it would be interesting to see those comparisons. Um, and then the other thing was a clarification question. Um, I think slide seven something about the job completion and then you break it down into, um, you can go to slide seven, um, then it said something about 18% of women completing who started out aspiring in engineering. I just wanted if you can clarify that. Um, I wasn't sure, there's a lot of numbers on that slide and I wasn't sure if that's what it was saying, but uh, when it says 18% engineering completion, can you explain what that means? So among engineering completers, 18% uh, and the broader data set for women. women. Okay, so it's not 18 Right, it, it's not it's not saying 18 percent of women who started in engineering complete. And actually, some of our other analysis show that once we get women into engineering, so the 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 interest into engineering is what's tough. But once we get them in, they're about as likely to complete the, as men. Their completion rates are very comparable to men in in this, and overall, their completion rates are higher in higher education. So. But my experience has been at a number of institutions that you, to increase your graduation rates, increase the percentage of women in your, in your program. Exactly. It's one of the strategies. <laughs> All right. Please join me in uh, thanking our presenters. Thank you. That's great. Um, uh, we will uh, invite our panelists to come up here. Um, I should have said that the bios are um, in your packet, so I'm just introducing them by title, but you can read more about all of our panelists and our presenters uh, in your packet. Give you a minute to do that. <clears throat> All right, we'll go ahead and get started. And our uh, panelists have been asked to um, 
respond to the, the uh, presentation and a reminder that what we're looking at here are factors that are influencing these decisions, the educational and career decisions. So our first panelist is Steve Brown, who is a professor at, um, who is the Father Walter P. Krolikowski Research Professor at Loyola University. Steve. Okay. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for inviting me as a non-engineer. I'm, in, I'm one of Nadja's colleagues in psychology. Um, and second, after listening to the paper, I'm really not sure why I'm here. Um, I thought in reading preliminary um, material I was sent, I was supposed to talk about why everybody's leaving engineering. Looks pretty good. Um, the data look pretty good. So, well, let me start. Um, and I think I will address those 20% of people who get a bachelor's degree in engineering who are in non-engineering graduate school and the 28% who are doing non-STEM work and maybe have some insights on that. Um, I also, and I'm, I'm a reactant, but I, this morning I got up and prepared some remarks on the basis of what I thought I was going to hear, which I didn't. Um, but anyway, my research, as some of you know from Nadja's presentation, has been focused on one theory that uh, Gail Hackett, Bob Lent, and I developed called social cognitive career theory. And it's a theory that tries to explain and predict occupational interest, occupational entry, and occupational persistence. And in a nutshell, the theory suggests that given adequate resources and given adequate ability, interest, choice, and persistence is driv are driven by two major variables, two major factors. One of which I was, one of which is self-efficacy beliefs. And that is my confidence that I can do what's necessary to be successful in whatever field I've chosen. And my prepared remarks were going to say, I'm quite pleased to see self-efficacy incorporated in a lot of research that I read in preparing. Um, incorporated in questions addressed, incorporated in terms of variables uh, studied, um, it turns out that I didn't hear about self-efficacy. But what I did hear about was the other important variable that I saw m missing from all the research I read in preparation, and that second variable is outcome expectations. It's the anticipated consequences of engaging in a certain career path. Um, if you will, the anticipated gains, balance in gains and losses that a person sees as accruing in participating in a career field. And I, had, I saw that important variable missing in all the research I read to prepare, but I didn't see it missing here. Outcome expectations are, like I said, they address questions such as, will I make enough money in this field? Will I get the recognition that I want in this field? Um, will I be able to live the lifestyle I want to in this field? Will my work environment be welcoming in this field? Will I be able, if this is important, be of service to others? In a, those are the types of questions that are addressed in outcome expectations. And in one of the slides, and I can't remember which one it was, looking at reasons for why people didn't choose engineering or STEM fields, that x-axis was just filled with outcome expectations. Um, so my, kind of my bottom line is, in terms of what I thought I was going to talk about, is that people don't leave engineering, especially the best and brightest don't leave engineering because they don't think they can do it. 
because they don't have the self-efficacy beliefs. They leave because they see that they may get something, some, something they want more from another field than engineering. And that research, need in, on, and research needs to focus as much on outcome expectations in explaining the leaving different types of occupations as it focuses on self-efficacy beliefs. And focusing only on self-efficacy beliefs m misses a big part of the puzzle. Um, let me finish up, and it, this is related to kind of illustrate what I'm talking about. Um, David Lubinsky and Camille Benbow at Vanderbilt University have done, they have some really interesting longitudinal data. Uh, they, um, over the years, they've identified kids who in eighth grade were in the top 1% of mathematical talent. Over the years, they followed these kids up and there, a lot of them are now employed. And what they find is that they're all quite, most of them are quite successful. As you might expect, more of these mathematically talented kids, more of the mathematically ta talented boys end up in STEM fields. The, ma these, the mathematically talented girls are just as successful as the boys, and you saw it on some of the slides. They tend to be quite successful as physicians, as lawyers, as business people, and, it's, and they're not in business law and uh, medicine because they don't think they're good enough at math. That's not the reason. They're in these other fields because of outcome expectations. For example, sex differences in interest and values have really diminished over the years, but one or two clear sex differences remain, and one, one is in values. Women tend more than men to value uh, social um, helping type values. In terms of interest, there's a big sex difference in interest and in interest in working with people or things. Women tend to prefer to work with people, help, with, help people, teach people. Men t prefer to work with things. And I think one thing that's driving um, David and Camille's data are these outcome expectations. Women end up in fields highly successful in business, in medicine, in law, because they're perceiving, at least thinking, that those, are those careers versus engineering are going to satisfy those social altruistic interests in values more than engineering. I think I've used my time. Right. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, next, we will hear from Andrew Gillis, senior researcher at the education program at the American Institutes for Research. Well, yeah. Thanks for thanks for having me. And uh, and like Dr. Brown, uh, I'm I'm not an engineer, uh, so I was a little. Um, uh, hesitant to, uh, to to come talk, um, but uh, but there is quite a quite a bit of uh, education um, research going on into into why students choose uh, to to enter a field or not, and uh, and whether or not they they end up working in in that career. Um, my own my own kind of most original uh, contribution to to the field uh, was I looked at uh, gender imbalance within uh, STEM education at doctoral edu at uh, in doctor education. Uh, so if you look at uh, if you look at the STEM fields, uh, men are very very overrepresented, um, and and what we were curious about was is that overrepresentation at that doctoral level is that originating earlier or is that emerging at the at the doctorate level, um, and and so what we did was we looked at the uh, how many women versus how many men get an undergraduate degree in in various fields, um, and we basically used that as a proxy for interest in that field uh, by gender. Uh, so, so we were basically expecting to see that same gender breakdown that we see at the undergraduate level, at the doctoral level. Um, and, and then we were basically just gonna classify 
um, doctoral education uh, as being uh, overrepresent male overrepresented or female overrepresented uh, based on if that differed. Um, and, and so the, the headline findings from that were about three quarters of, of academic fields are, are have uh, males overrepresented and about one quarter of females overrepresented. Uh, but what's interesting about this is that STEM fields are actually slightly more gender balanced uh, than non STEM fields, uh, which is kind of going against uh, um, uh, the conventional wisdom there. Uh, and then within STEM fields, uh, biological and biomedical sciences and the physical sciences show the greatest overrepresentation of males. Uh, but engineering, uh, the, as, a, as a broad group, actually comes out relatively gender balanced. Uh, so of the, of the 21 fields, and I actually threw in a, a 22nd here, which is uh, an engineering related fields. Uh, but of those 22, about 13 are, are roughly gender balanced. Uh, about four are uh, females are overrepresented, and then only five uh, of those fields are, are males uh, overrepresented. And, uh, so, so the males are overrepresented in things like materials engineering, engineering mechanics, engineering science, tech textile sciences, and operations research. Um, and, and so this was, this was um, kind of a, an interesting finding for us because it was not at all what we expected to find. We were expecting to f see that STEM fields, and particularly things like engineering, uh, would, would be even more gender unbalanced after after the doctoral level. Uh, but, but the basic story that, that kind of emerged here was that, at least for engineering, um, the gender imbalances that we see among doctoral, doctoral degree recipients uh, is actually a function mostly of what's happening prior to doctoral education. So it's, it's happening at the undergraduate level or even earlier, um, which, uh, which, which was definitely interesting. Uh, the, the other thing that I, uh, that I wanted to talk about um, was that there's, there's actually a survey that I don't necessarily compliment Sylvia and Kevin's. Um, there's, there's a survey that the, the Department of Education runs. It's called the Baccalaureate and Beyond. Um, and, and they've done a few iterations of this. The, the one I want to focus on is, is the one that uh, started in 2007, 2008. Uh, so they basically look at students who got a bachelor's degree in 2008, and they've tracked them over time. Uh, so, so they only have uh, the, the most recent data they released was, was a follow-up in, uh, in 2012. Uh, but this nicely complements the survey data that, that Sylvia and Kevin had. Um, and, uh, and, and so a, a lot of those findings are, are, are largely the same. Uh, so for engineering students, uh, about three quarters of them have a full-time job. Uh, very, very low unemployment rate. Uh, according to this survey, it's, it's only about, it's less than 5% uh, unemployment rate. Uh, and a lot of the, uh, some, some of those students are, are in, are in uh, school as well. So why they're caught being caught, why they consider themselves unemployed is, is, uh, is, is, is interesting. Uh, but, but relative to, to what Sylvia and Kevin were, were um, uh, presenting, uh, there's, uh, this is an even lower unemployment rate. I think they had about 10% unemployment. Uh, the, this particular survey has about a 5% unemployment. Uh, but there's also a lot less in grad school. Uh, so they had a, a pretty high proportion, I think about 35% in, uh, in grad school. Um, and, the, and, and it's much lower uh, in, in this particular uh, survey. Uh, so, so of the uh, of the students who were employed, uh, about 14% of them in the survey did not consider their, their current job to be related at all to, to engineering. And the, the other options were closely related and somewhat related. Uh, now this is actually um, much better than the, the national average across all uh, graduating um, undergraduates. So, so across all undergraduates, it's 23%. Uh, among engineering undergraduates, it's only 14%. So that's actually pretty good. Uh, but a lot of, a lot of the, um, uh, the the tie-in uh, falls into the somewhat related category. Uh, so so the, the, the engineering students don't consider themselves uh, to be working in a closely related job to, to their field uh, to, as a, to a much greater extent than, than is typical, uh, but a lot of them are, are in that somewhat related uh, category. Uh, so, so they're tangentially related uh, uh, much, much more closely. Uh, so, so one of the one of the most interesting things uh, in this particular survey was they asked about um, why students who weren't working in their field uh, were not doing that, um, and and the and the three top reasons that the students gave were uh, number one that no no job in their field was available, 
and that was given by about 37% of the students who, who are not working in their field. Uh, the second one was pay or promotion opportunities. And then the third one was the change in interests. Um, and and I, I wanna focus on the, on the first and the third one. Uh, so so not, no job in the field available. Uh, so the national average was about 33%, uh, for engineering it's 37%. Uh, so that's pretty comparable. Uh, this is actually very closely, this is about the exact same number as, as the, uh, the figures for business uh, uh, students. So students who major in business but don't end up working in business, about 37% of those students also do so because they can't find a job in business. Uh, but, but almost the more interesting one is the, is the change in either uh, in the student's uh, career or professional interests. Um, and, and about 20% of engineering students who don't work in engineering uh, said that they just kind of lost interest in, in the field. Um, and this is off the charts compared to, to every other field. Uh, so the national average is about 10% among all, among all uh, undergraduate students. And the closest big subfield that we can get uh, so, so this is a very, very distant second place to, to engineering, uh, was biological, physical sciences, science, technology, math, and that was only about 12%. Uh, so, th so this is, re this is really uh, kind of eye-opening. So this is telling us that there's a, a, a lot of lost interest um, once, once these students um, uh, leave, leave school and, and enter the workforce. Uh, so so where, do, where do they end up going? Uh, a lot of them go into business, um, and, uh, and computer, information, computer and information systems are another big one, and, and uh, post-secondary uh, teachers are, are another category. Um, I, we were also able to look a little bit at um, where engineers who are not engineering students come from, uh, and the biggest contributors were that biological, physical sciences, um, uh, mathematics field, uh, but also business, uh, which, which I found pretty interesting. So, so about, uh, about 5% of, uh, of engineers, um, of college-educated engineers, actually came from a, from a business uh, background. Uh, so, so once uh, once students are in the engineering field, um, there's there's a couple of things that, that were pretty interesting in the survey. Uh, the first is that uh, they're more likely to view their job to be part of uh, of, a, of a long term career. Um, so, so, so the the national average for that 76 percent for engineering is about 86 uh, percent. What's what's really interesting uh, is is among the engineering students. Uh, there's, you, can, you can ask them about their satisfa satisfaction along these, these five different dimensions. Uh, challenge of work, compensation, importance of work, work-life balance, and job security. And engineering students are much happier than everybody else. Uh, on, on all five of, the, of those dimensions, um, which is also interesting. Um, and, then, uh, and then related to the, the infamous slide uh, 33 from, from uh, Sylvie and Kevin, um, <laughs> there's, uh, it, you, you can ask them if they're, if they're currently looking for a job. So these are students who, who graduated in 2008, they're working in engineering, um, are they currently looking for a job? About 22% of them are. Uh, but that's lower than the national average of 27%. Uh, so so my, my interpretation of your 46% expect to change careers is that, yeah, that's high, but it's even higher in every other field. Um, so maybe it's 60% in, in other fields. Uh, so my main takeaways, because I think I'm running out of time here, uh, is that uh, right at the beginning of a, of a career, there's really big push and pull factors um, that, that are affecting whether engineering students go into engineering. So a lot of them can't find a job, uh, but we have to keep in mind that this was the, the cohort that, that graduated in 2008, so it was a, a bad economy. Um, so, so that figure might be a little bit inflated. But what was really interesting to me was that 20% of the students who, who just lost interest in engineering. Um, so, so you get it, you lose a, a you have a huge uh, starting attrition level, but once you get into, once you lose that initial batch, uh, the, the, the engineering students are more happy uh, with their job, they aren't looking for jobs as much, and they, and they view it as a long-term career. Uh, so, so you get a huge immediate attrition, but after that, uh, things seem to, be, seem to go pretty well. Uh, and then the only other thing I, I noticed uh, that, that caught my eye was that you, you see a lot of two-way streets uh, when I was looking at the data. So like there's a lot of engineers that go into business, but then there's just a lot of business uh, students who, who go into engineering. Uh, but it, there is mostly a one-way street from engineering into computer sciences. Uh, so a lot of engineers end up doing uh, uh, computer uh, or information system work, uh, but there's, almost, the, there's, there's much less uh, um, traffic coming the other way from computer and information sciences uh, into, into engineering, which I thought was interesting. So. 
Thank you. And our um, final panelist is an engineer. She is the, um, she's an assistant professor. She's a Nicholas and Nancy Petrie Professor of Construction Engineering and Management um, at the University of Colorado. Amy. Well, thanks. Um, it's been great to be part of this panel and to hear that we really have a consistent story. Um, I'm going to talk specifically about a group of engineers, Engineers Without Borders members, or EWB, um, that we've been studying together with my PhD student, Caitlin Litchfield, for about three years now. Can I just get a, a hand raising? Who has heard of EWB, or Engineers Without Borders? Okay, great. So we have a, an audience that, that knows about this, this uh, group well. Just for those that don't, it's a nonprofit humanitarian engineering organization that designs and constructs projects, often in international locations, with a dual goal, really, of creating experiences for the students um, in terms of global perspectives and creating responsible leaders. So I was really interested in this group of students because it's been rapidly growing. So over the last uh, 12 years, they have about 15,000 members that they know of. Um, that includes both students and professionals, and it's 40% women, which contrasted the population of engineering population that I was aware of. Um, so, so it's roughly gender balanced. And because of the types of learning experiences and engagements that these people are, that, that these students and professionals are being able to deal with. So we really wanted to compare and contrast what was this growing population that was, that was creating, that's a huge population of our engineering population, and what did that mean in terms of motivations, in terms of the types of skills that they were gaining, and in terms of their career, their career outcome expectations. Um, so we really did a mixed method uh, approach where we used qualitative data. We t obtained about 700 open-ended questionnaires. We did uh, 27 interviews, 32 focus groups. And then from that data, we sent out an online um, survey questionnaire that was answered by about 3,000 people. So if you want any of the specific data, please feel free to follow up with me. But I wanted to talk about those three main areas, the motivations, those skills, as well as their career um, expectations. Overall, we found that this population was still very much an engineer, but they also had modifiers. So in our qualitative data, we frequently found people describing themselves as, I am an engineer, but let me tell you all the ways that I'm not an engineer, because they actually like to work with people. I actually want to help society. Um, I, I like reading and writing. I like talking. Um, and so there is a ton of modifications that these, that these students were using um, with us. So we, we wanted to really understand this group a little bit more. And the survey results did that. For motivations, um, in our qualitative data, we found very similar results to, to what other people had found. And this was similar for the, those involved in EWB and those not involved in EWB. So intrinsic motivations are high, similar to Sherry Shepard's story. Also, social good motivations came out high. Interestingly, we expected that women, whether they were involved in EWB or not involved in EWB, were going to have a high component of social good. What we found instead was that EWB members, fe females were the highest, then EWB men, then women. So EWB men were also very high in pursuing engineering for social good, going back to that definition of engineering that Dan Mote had, had talked about yesterday. In our survey, we controlled for gender, age, GPA, and degree, and we found that EWB members were very similar to engineers. They were an engineer, but they had statistically significant higher interest in social good and working in, in, for community development. Then we wanted to look at skills. So we've talked a lot about the need for this T-shaped education that was mentioned earlier, this depth in technical skills, but also getting what some people have called soft skills and what I'm going to call professional skills um, from our engineers. So during our qualitative data, many people talked about the gains that they were experiencing from their EWV involvement. This is, this is a group that has to fundraise for themselves. They have to figure out logistics. They have to go into a new country. They have to construct a project. And, and that requires communication. It requires working on multidisciplinary teams, et cetera. So we wanted to test that. And so what we did is in our survey, we asked um, 
about 46 items in the survey questionnaire that dealt with ABET's A through K outcomes as well as Cassie's L through O outcomes. And so this was, this was your, your perception of your ability to do the following things. What we found is that EWB members still perceived themselves to have the same level of technical skills as those not engaged in EWB. So they very much have the depth. However, they were significantly statistically higher in their professional skill development, which makes sense based upon the experiences that they're gaining. We did control, again, in that case, for age, gender, and GPA. And if you want those results, I'm happy to provide them. The, la the last piece that we really wanted to look at is, a, is about these pathways of these students, these career interests and expectations. And again, a lot of them were planning on going into engineering design and engineering related fields. However, there was, there was differences in terms of wanting to do project management, being in organizational management, working in nonprofit community development, and wanting to pursue public policy, government, and law. Um, and so, so those are very, very wide interests. Um, we really saw three pathways, though. So those that were willingly pursuing engineering work, which is a large majority, those were unwillingly pursuing engineering work. And they were unwillingly doing that in order to have financial stability, to pay back their student loans, or to pay their dues to get their professional engineering license. They then plan to leave. Then we have those that were willingly pursuing non-engineering work. And this was all about, from our qualitative data, the meaningful experiences of their work and finding alignment and joy um, in, 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 their, in their careers. So to me, this was really a warning. And we, we consider this kind of this um, minor's canary of these students who exemplify many of the traits that we say we're looking for. NAE's Engineer of 2020 wants people with technical depth that also have professional skills. These people are highly motivated for social good. That's part of our definition of engineering. But these people are also willingly leaving engineering fields to pursue other, other degrees and other careers. This was in line with Atman's findings that engineers who remained in engineering were often less confident in their professional skills than those who left. And then Shepard just really recently came out with a finding that the highest performing graduates are leaving at rates that are higher than their lower performing peers. Um, so I, I am a little concerned about this. Um, I find it a little bit troubling that we aren't finding engineering meaningful. So I really wanted to talk about a couple of questions that I'm hoping to get your, your feedback and, and, um, on. We've, we've talked a lot about what is engineering and what is engineering related. And we have, a, we, we have classifications for that. Do we need to revisit that classification? And what are the perceptions of the students of what engineering is? I said that we, we talked a lot about this and. Inge I'm an engineer and I'm also in it for the social good and, and, and I want to do all of these things. Isn't that what an engineer is per our definition? So I'd, I'd really like us to spend some time thinking about that. Finally, we've done a lot to change the conversation of engineering. And so we are often recruiting a lot of women and a lot of people that want to do engineering for the social good into our engineering programs. And they're graduating from, from these degrees at higher rates. But then what happens when they enter the field? Is the conversation that we are doing engineering for social good actually in our professions? And, and what should we do, be doing about that? Because I know a lot of people that come to me that are troubled with finding meaningful work and finding the work that we're promising them when we talk about what an engineer is. So thank you. Thank you. This is great to get these different perspectives. I want to open it up for questions now or comments, and um, again, I will ask you to make sure you identify yourself so that all of us know who's, who's asking the question. Can I, can I make a comment? Oops, can I make? That was wonderful, both of them were. Um, if 
w one thought I had as I was listening, if you're really interested, really interested in attracting more women and people of color into engineering, EWB is it. How widespread? How, how much does the general public, how much do girls and people of color in the high schools know about e EWB? I think that would be a wonderful marketing tool to attract more women and people of color into the profession, into engineering. However, I also heard that there has to be some follow-up in those social justice, that those social justice in, um, interests are reinforced once people arrive. But I can't imagine a better way to attract women and people in co of color to the, to the engineering, uh, a, a better way than getting EWB out to the public. Um, so. Emily Allen, Cal State LA. Um, a couple times people have talked about, um, and not, not necessarily this group, about the higher performing students leaving are the ones who are leaving. And I'm, I'm a little confused about that data and what, what, why they're called higher performing. I mean, based on what? Is it that, um, is it that they're, the outcomes, expectations they have in the workplace aren't met, and does that have anything to do with them being higher performing? Or is it just data from more selective schools? I'm a little confused about what we're talking about. And on the flip side of that, when we look at attracting women and minorities to engineering because it does it, to make the world a better place, but when they look out at the employment sectors, much of what the employment sectors do is not not necessarily bad, but it's you know it's it's building more roads and building more things that people consider to be not the public good in in a different way of looking at it. So would we be attracting more students that then cannot be employed? And is that a good strategy for for bringing in underrepresented students? I know it's a big Big question. I, that's the question. I, I, don't, I don't know the data, but in the materials I was sent, that was one statement that the best and the brightest are leaving, and that's what I thought I was going to address. Uh, and I, in my hypothesis, would be it's not because they don't think they're good. They are good. It's primarily due to these outcome expectations. Uh, that's that part of your question I could address, but I don't know where the data are coming from. Yeah. I don't know if you remember, Kevin, how the higher ability students, they seem to be highly retained in engineering. That's what our data is showing. So I think one of the things we should do for the report is really clarify whether that's the case and what the possibilities are before we start explaining things that we may not know. But uh, we haven't seen, uh, we can double check and test evidence from uh, a number of our, the largest databases we have to check that. And I believe if you're analyzing uh, the baccalaureate and beyond, you could check that as well. But I want to just add just one thing about our proportion of graduate school going on is higher because we are looking at first time, full time freshmen. So we think these students have the most opportunity to stay uh, and uh, in college, though their retention rates vary considerably. So we're seeing a lot of mobility anyway in those students. But anyway, we need to go back and check that assumption before we start explaining it. Yeah, um, Judy Sezzo, American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering and uh, Western New England University. So one of my questions here is, we seem to think it's negative if students leave the engineering profession. But I actually have some cases in point of my students that I actually think it's great 
that uh, we're training engineers that then actually can go and apply their engineering skills to public policy, to public health, to medicine. Uh, and so I guess my question is, my concern is those that we lose because they're, they then are unemployable. Uh, but I th and, and so I think we need to make sure that we're keeping the cohorts separate for those that we lose because of the economic reasons and those we lose because of the altruism or other career interests. Because I actually think it'd be great if we had more engineers uh, in, in public policy, public service, and things like that. And so I think when we see this as a negative, that I actually, as a field, think we should celebrate this. And so I guess th th that's my question is, can we actually separate these two distinct groups that are leaving engineering for various reasons? I'd, I'd actually add a third uh, to that list would be the, the concern that there's a differential retention for environmental reasons, that people are not being retained because, uh, because there's some negative environment for, that, for those individuals, which then becomes an outcome expectations. Um, I, okay, we have a, we have a question there. Oh. Can I respond really quickly? Oh, yeah, sure. So, so I also agree with you. I think it's fantastic that we have engineers in, in all of these professions, so I don't want that to come across. What I am concerned about are those people that are really having tensions in their job, um, a lot of times due to workplace environment or not fitting in because they see themselves as, as different to not being able to, to um, help the social good. So I, I completely agree that I think it's great. Yeah, and I do, I do as well. Uh, my, my background is in economics, and we're probably the most imperialistic field within the social sciences. Um, and, and so we're, we're quite accustomed to most economists not actually doing economics. Like, they, they just go do whatever they want to do and call it the economics of, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so, yeah, that's, it, it, it is interesting that, that engineers tend to view it as a bad thing, whereas economists just view it as a normal fact of life. We have a question over here. Yeah, um, so I guess I'll, I'll okay. continue that line of thinking and support that. I'm Scott Mark with Medtronic, and um, I, I would say we, we absolutely value engineers not just for working strictly in engineering jobs, but also in going into other areas of the company that still require an engineering background. So, for example, we have a lot of um, salespeople that have degrees in EE. Um, biomedical, uh, lots of people in marketing and product design roles have that. Our CEO has a BS and a PhD in EE. So um, I would just like to underscore that I, I think that's considered a success for us when we have people enter those roles and move, move elsewhere in the organization, just as a comment. And then I guess I would also challenge that as not leaving engineering when you particularly go into management of engineering. I, I think personally from an industry perspective, I'd like to see that considered staying in engineering. Um, I guess one, one question perhaps for the study but also for any of the panelists is there hasn't been a lot of um, discussion I've heard about um, internships and how that might align with both satisfaction in the field and, and also just easing this, this continuum and decision making towards staying in, in engineering. I think again from an industry perspective we very much value that as an opportunity to evaluate incoming students and, um, and help with that transition so I'd like to hear thoughts on that. So I think uh, I think internships would probably be a really good way uh, for to, to increase interest in engineering, particularly because the employed engineers are so satisfied with their jobs, um, and that's gonna that's gonna show during an internship. Um, a lot of, in a lot of other fields um, that that the workers aren't as satisfied, um, the internship might actually backfire a little bit in in terms of uh, uh, increasing interest. <coughs> Yeah, um, I'm Bridget Rosendahl from Bechtel, and on the internship question, um, I, I bring in an intern every summer and teach them uh, how to do engineering, either uh, uh, at the undergraduate level or even graduate students, we bring them in. And we find great success at retaining these interns coming back to Bechtel um, later after they graduate. So I think the internship pro program is absolutely a brilliant way to get students really interested in becoming engineers professionally, um, long term. Thank you. 
Uh, Sylvia, did you want to respond to that? Yeah, I wanted to respond to the internships. One of the areas that we have followed up, now most of our work has been at the undergraduate level, so this additional work is only for this particular cohort, uh, the post-baccalaureate level. But we saw the internships are very valuable uh, for retention in undergraduate education uh, in STEM, and so it's one of the many areas. The other is uh, research with a faculty member, and certainly any ways that students are more engaged with other peers as well but early exposure, and some of our qualitative work, we also found students were doing internships in industry and also taking on uh, work with faculty in their uh, departments, so that was really a nice way. Those students are gonna stay in STEM, so we found that, uh, that an important impact at the undergraduate level. Thank you. And I, I know in my department at the University of Colorado, we encourage a student to either have an internship or a co-op, a uh, research experience with faculty, um, or a service learning experience like EWB in order to graduate. Thank you, yes. Larry Bucciarelli again from MIT. A question for Amy. Do, uh, in these schools that you surveyed, do the, uh, these schools or the programs that the students are in, the students that participate in Engineers Without Borders, do they receive a hard academic credit for either their participation in this activity or say in an associated course? So, so we did not ask that on the survey, but our anecdotal evidence and from our interviews um, and focus groups, we found that many people are not receiving academic credit for this. The exceptions are when a student is very motivated and goes to the faculty of perhaps a senior capstone design and actually has their EWB project as their capstone design. Um, and, and we were talking last night, a lot of students actually want this to not be considered credit because they, they value it so much and they only want other people working on it that are gonna be putting in the passion towards it. So it, it was a really interesting debate. Additional questions? All right, then I think we uh, owe our panelists a round of applause. <laughs>